Hello there children, Mrs Ashton here. Thank you for joining me for the next couple of chapters of A Series of Unfortunate Events, The Bad Beginning by Lemony Snicket. So in the first couple of chapters we met the three Baudelaire children who were unfortunately told by a family friend, Mr Poe, that their parents had passed away and that they were to live with a very strange man called Count Olaf and it seems that he may be interested in their family's fortune. So let's find out what happens next. Chapter three. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but first impressions are often entirely wrong. You can look at a painting for the first time, for example, and not like it at all. But after looking at it a little longer, you may find it very pleasing. The first time you quite try gorgonzola cheese, you may find it too strong. But when you are older, you may want to eat nothing but gorgonzola cheese. Klaus, when Sunny was born, did not like her at all. But by the time she was six weeks old, the two of them were thick as thieves. Your initial opinion on just about anything may change over time. I wish I could tell you that the Baudelaire's first impressions of Count Olaf and his house were incorrect, as first impressions so often are. But these impressions that Count Olaf was a horrible person and his house a depressing pigsty were absolutely correct. During the first few days after the orphans' arrival at Count Olaf's, Violet, Klaus and Sunny attempted to make themselves feel at home but it was really no use. Even though Count Olaf's house was quite large, the three children were placed together in one filthy bedroom that had only one small bed in it. Cla Violet and Klaus took turns sleeping in it, so that every other night one of them was in the bed and the other was sleeping on the hard wooden floor, and the bed's mattress was so lumpy it was difficult to say who was more comfortable. To make a bed for Sunny, Violet removed the dusty curtains from the curtain rod that hung over the bedroom's one window and bunched them together to form a sort of cushion, just big enough for her sister. However, without curtains over the cracked glass, the sun streamed through the window every morning, so the children woke up early and saw each day. Instead of a closet, there was a large cardboard box that had once held a refrigerator and would now hold the three children's clothes all piled up in a heap. Instead of toys, books or other things to amuse the youngsters, Count Olaf had provided a small pile of rocks. And the only decoration on the peeling walls was a large and ugly painting of an eye, matching the one on Count Olaf's ankle and all over the house. But the children knew, as I'm sure you know, that the worst surroundings in the world can be tolerated if the people in them are interesting and kind. Count Olaf was neither interesting nor kind. He was demanding, short-tempered and bad-smelling. The only good thing to be said for Count Olaf is that he wasn't around very often. When the children woke up and chose their clothing out of the refrigerator box, they would walk into the kitchen and find a list of instructions left for them by Count Olaf, who would often not appear until night time. Most of the day he spent out of the house or up in the high tower where the children were forbidden to go. The instructions he left for them were usually difficult chores, such as repainting the back porch or repairing the windows. And instead of a signature, Count Olaf would draw an eye at the bottom of his note. One morning, his note read, My theatre troupe will be coming for dinner before tonight's performance. Have dinner ready for all ten of them by the time they arrive at seven o'clock. Buy the food. Prepare it, set the table, serve dinner, clean up afterwards, and stay out of our way. Below that, there was the usual eye, and underneath the note was a small sum of money for the groceries. Violet and Klaus read the note as they ate their breakfast, which was a grey and lumpy oatmeal Count Olaf left for them each morning in a large pot on the stove. Then they looked at each other in dismay. <sighs> None of us knows how to cook. Klaus said. That's true, Violet said. I knew how to repair those windows and how to clean the chimney because those sort of things interest me. But I don't know how to cook anything except for toast. And sometimes you burn the toast, Klaus said, and they smiled. They were both remembering a time when the two of them got up early to make a special breakfast for their parents. Violet had burnt the toast and their parents, smelling smoke, had run downstairs to see what the matter was. 
When they saw Violet and Klaus looking forlornly at pieces of pitch black toast, they laughed and laughed and then made pancakes for the whole family. I wish they were here, Violet said. She did not have to explain she was talking about their parents. They would never let us stay in this dreadful place. If they were here, Klaus said, his voice rising as he got more and more upset, we would not be with Count Olaf in the first place. I hate it here, Violet. I hate this house. I hate our room. I hate having to do all these chores. And I hate Count Olaf. I hate it too, Violet said. And Klaus looked at his older sister with relief. Sometimes just saying that you hate something and having someone agree with you can make you feel better about a terrible situation. I hate everything about our lives right now, Klaus, she said, but we have to keep our chin up. This was an expression the children's father had used and it meant try to stay cheerful. You're right, Klaus said, but it's very difficult to keep one's chin up when Count Olaf keeps shoving it down. Duke, Sunny shrieked, banging on the table with her oatmeal spoon. Violet and Klaus were jerked out of their conversation and looked once again at Count Olaf's note. Perhaps we can find a cookbook and read about how to cook, Klaus said. It shouldn't be that difficult to make a simple meal. Violet and Klaus spent several minutes opening and shutting Count Olaf's kitchen cupboards, but there wasn't any cookbooks to be found. I can't say I'm surprised, Violet said. We haven't found any books in this house at all. I know, Klaus said miserably. I miss reading very much. We must go out and look for a library sometime soon. But not today, Violet said. Today we have to cook for 10 people. At that moment, there was a knock on the front door. Violet and Klaus looked at one another nervously. Who in the world would want to visit Count Olaf? Violet wondered out loud. Maybe somebody wants to visit us, Klaus said, without much hope. In the time since the Baudelaire parents' death, most of the Baudelaire orphans' friends had fallen by the wayside, an expression which here means they stopped calling, writing and stopping by to see any of the Baudelaire's, making them very lonely. You and I, of course, would never do this to any of our grieving acquaintances, but it is a sad truth in life that when someone has lost a loved one, friends sometimes avoid the person, just when the presence of friends is most needed. Violet, Klaus and Sunny walked slowly to the front door and peered through the peephole, which was in the shape of an eye. They were delighted to see Justice Strauss peering back at them and open the door. Justice Strauss, Violet cried. How lovely to see you. She was about to add, do you come in? But then she realised that Justice Strauss would probably not want to venture into the dim and dirty room. Please forgive me for not stopping by sooner, Justice Strauss said, as the Baudelaire stood awkwardly in the doorway. I wanted to see how you children were settling in, but I had a very difficult case in the High Court and it was taking up much of my time. What sort of case was it? Klaus asked. Having been deprived of reading, he was hungry for new information. I can't really discuss it, Justice Strauss said, because it's official business but I can tell you it concerns a poisonous plant and illegal use of someone's credit card. Yika! Sunny shrieked, which appeared to mean, how interesting. Although of course there is no way that Sunny could understand what was being said. Justice Strauss looked down at Sunny and laughed, Yika indeed, she said, and reached down to pat the child on the head. Sunny took Justice Strauss's hand and bit it gently. That means she likes you, Violet explained. She bites very, very hard if she doesn't like you, or if you want, or if you want to give her a bath. I see, Justice Strauss said. Now then, how are you children getting on? Is there anything you desire? The children looked at one another, thinking of all the things they desired. Another bed, for example. A proper crib for Sunny. Curtains for the window in their room. A closet instead of a cardboard box. But what they desired most of all, of course, was not to be associated with Count Olaf in any way whatsoever. What they desired most was to be home with their parents, in their true home. But that, of, a, of course, was impossible. Violet, Klaus and Sunny all looked down at the floor unhappily as they considered the question. 
Finally, Klaus spoke. Could we perhaps borrow a cookbook, he said. Count Olaf has instructed us to make dinner for his theatre troupe tonight, and we can't find a cookbook in the house. Goodness, Justice Strauss said. Cooking dinner for an entire theatre troupe seems like a lot to ask from children. Count Olaf gives us a lot of responsibility, Violet said. What she wanted to say was, Count Olaf is an evil man, but she was well-mannered. Well, why don't you come next door to my house, Justice Strauss said, and find a cookbook that pleases you. The youngsters agreed and followed Justice Strauss out the door and over to her well-kept house. She led them through an elegant hallway, spelling of flowers into an enormous room, and when they saw what was inside, they nearly fainted from delight, Klaus especially. The room was a library, not a public library, but a private library. That is, a large collection of books belonging to Justice Strauss. There were shelves and shelves of them on every wall from the floor to the ceiling and separate shelves and shelves of them in the middle of the room. The only place there weren't books was in one corner where there were some large comfortable looking chairs and a wooden table with lamps hang hanging over them, perfect for reading. Although it was not as big as their parents' library, it was as cosy and the Baudelaire children were thrilled. My word, Violet said, this is a wonderful library. Thank you very much, Justice Strauss said. I've been collecting books for years and I'm very proud of my collection. As long as you keep them in good condition, you are welcome to use any of my books at any time. Now, the cookbooks are over here on the eastern wall. Shall we have a look at them? Yes, Violet said. And then, if you don't mind, I should love to look at any of your books concerning mechanical engineering. Inventing things is a great interest of mine. And I would like to look at books on wolves, Klaus said. Recently, I've been fascinated by the subject of wild animals of North America. Book! Sunny shrieked, which meant, please don't forget to pick out a picture book for me. Justice Strauss smiled. It is a pleasure to see young people interested in books, she said. But first, I think we'd better find a good recipe, don't you? The children agreed, and for 30 minutes or so, they perused several cookbooks that Justice Strauss recommended. To tell you the truth, the three orphans were so excited to be out of Count Olaf's house and in this pleasant library that they were a little distracted and unable to concentrate on cooking. But finally, Klaus found a dish that sounded delicious and easy to make. Listen to this, he said. Put an esca. It's an Italian sauce for pasta. All we need to do is saute olives, capers, anchovies, garlic, chopped parsley and tomatoes together in a pot and prepare spaghetti to go with it. Well, that sounds easy, Violet agreed, and the Baudelaire orphans looked at one another. Perhaps, with the kind Justice Strauss and her library right next door, the children could prepare pleasant lives for themselves as easily as making puttanesca sauce for Count Olaf. Chapter 4 The Baudelaire orphans copied the puttanesca recipe from the cookbook onto a piece of scrap paper, and Justice Strauss was kind enough to escort them to the market to buy the necessary ingredients. Count Olaf had not left them very much money, but the children were able to buy everything they needed. From a street vendor, they purchased olives after tasting several varieties and choosing their favourites. At a pasta store, they selected interestingly shaped noodles and asked the woman running the store the proper amount for 13 people. The 10 people Count Olaf mentioned, and the three of them. Then, at the supermarket, they purchased garlic, which is a sharp tasting bulbous plant, anchovies, which are small salty fish, capers, which are flower buds of a small shrub and taste marvellous, and tomatoes, which are actually fruits and not vegetables, as most people believe. They thought it would be proper to serve dessert and bought several envelopes of pudding mix. Perhaps, the orphans thought, if they made a delicious meal, Count Olaf might be a bit kinder to them. Thank you so much for helping us out today, Violet said, as she and her siblings walked home with Justice Strauss. I don't know what we would have done without you. Well, you seem like very intelligent people, Justice Strauss said. I dare say you would have thought of something, but it continues to strike me as odd that Count Olaf has asked you to prepare such an enormous meal. Well, here we are. I must go inside and put my own groceries away. I hope you children will come over soon and borrow books from my library. Tomorrow? 
Klaus said quickly. Can we come over tomorrow? I don't see why not, just as Strauss said, smiling. I can't tell you how much we appreciate this, Violet said carefully. With their kind parents dead and Count Olaf treating them so awfully, the three children were not used to kindness from adults and weren't sure if they were expected to do anything back. Tomorrow, before we use your library again, Klaus and I would be more than happy to do household chores for you. Sunny isn't really old enough to work, but I'm sure we can find some way she can help you. Justice Strauss smiled at the three children, but her eyes were sad. She reached out a hand and put it on Violet's hair, and Violet felt more comforted than she had in some time. That won't be necessary, Justice Strauss said. You are always welcome in my home. Then she turned and went into her home, and after a moment of staring after her, the Baudelaire orphans went into theirs. For most of the afternoon, Violet Klaus and Sunny cooked the puttanesca sauce according to the recipe. Violet roasted the garlic and washed and chopped, chopped the anchovies. Klaus peeled the tomatoes and pitted the olives. Sunny banged on a pot with a wooden spoon, singing a rather repetitive song she had written herself. And all three of the children felt less miserable than they had since their arrival at Count Olaf's. The smell of cooking food is often a calming one, and the kitchen grew cosy as the sauce simmered, a culinary term which means cooked over low heat. The three orphans spoke of pleasant memories of their parents and about Justice Strauss, who they agreed was a wonderful neighbour and in whose library they planned to spend a great deal of time. As they talked, they mixed and tasted the chocolate pudding. Just as they were placing the pudding in the refrigerator to cool, Violet, Klaus and Sunny had a loud booming sound as the front door was flung open. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you who was home. Orphans! Count Olaf called out in his scratchy voice. Where are you orphans? In the kitchen, Count Olaf, Klaus called. We're finishing dinner. You better be, Count Olaf said and strode into the kitchen. He gazed at all three Baudelaire children with his shiny, shiny eyes. My troop is right behind me and they're very hungry. Where is the roast beef? We didn't make roast beef, Violet said. We made puttanesca sauce. What? Count Olaf asked. No roast beef? You didn't tell us you wanted roast beef, Klaus said. Count Olaf slid toward the children so that he looked even taller than he was. His eyes grew even brighter and his one eyebrow raised in anger. In agreeing to adopt you, he said, I have become your father. And as your father, I'm not someone to be trifled with. I demand that you serve roast beef to myself and my guests. We don't have any, Violet cried. We make puttanesca sauce. No, 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 Sonny shouted. Count Olaf looked down at Sonny, who had spoken so suddenly. With an inhuman roar, he picked her up in one scraggly hand and raised her so she was staring at him in the eye. Needless to say, Sonny was very frightened and began crying immediately, too scared to even try to bite the hand that held her. Put her down immediately, you beast, Klaus shouted. He jumped up trying to rescue Sonny from the grasp of the Count, but he was holding her too high to reach. Count Olaf looked down at Klaus and smiled a terrible, toothy grin, raising the wailing Sonny up even higher in the air. He seemed about to drop her to the floor when there was a large burst of laughter in the next room. Olaf! Where's Olaf? Voices called out. Count Olaf paused still holding the wailing Sonny up in the air as members of his theatre troupe walked into the kitchen. Soon they were crowding the room, an assortment of strange-looking characters of all shapes and sizes. There was a bold man with a very long nose, dressed in a long black robe. There were two women who had bright white powder all over their faces, making them look like ghosts. Behind the women was a man with very long and skinny arms, at the end of which were two hooks instead of hands. There was a person who was extremely fat and who looked like neither a man nor a woman. And behind this person, standing in the doorway, were an assortment of people the children could not see, but who promised to be just as frightening. Here you are, Olaf, said one of the white-faced women. What in the world are you doing? 
I'm just disciplining these orphans, Count Olaf said. I asked them to make dinner and all they have made is some disgusting sauce. You can't go easy on children, the man with the hook hand said. They must be taught to obey their elders. The tall, bold man peered at the youngsters. Are these, he said to Count Olaf, those wealthy children you were telling me about? Yes, Count Olaf said. They're so awful I can scarcely stand to touch them. With that, he lowered Sonny, who was still wailing, to the floor. Violet and Klaus breathed a sigh of relief that he had not dropped her from that great height. I don't blame you, said someone in the doorway. Count Olaf rubbed his hands together as if he had been holding something revolting instead of an infant. Well, enough talk, he said. I suppose we will eat their dinner, even though it's all wrong. Everyone, follow me to the dining room and I will pour us some wine. Perhaps by the time these brats serve us, we will be too drunk to care if it's roast beef or not. Hurrah! cried several members of the troop, and they marched through the kitchen, following Count Olaf into the dining room. Nobody paid a bit of attention to the children, except for the bold man, who stopped and stared Violet in the eye. You're a pretty one, he said, taking her face in his rough hands. If I were you, I would try not to anger Count Olaf, or he might wreck that pretty little face of yours. Violet shuddered, and the bold man gave a high-pitched giggle and left the room. The Baudelaire children, alone in the kitchen, found themselves breathing heavily, as if they had just run a long distance. Sonny continued to wail, and Klaus found that his eyes were wet with tears as well. Only Violet didn't cry, but merely trembled with fear and revulsion a word which here means an unpleasant mixture of horror and disgust. For several moments, none of them could speak. This is terrible, terrible, Klaus said finally. Violet, what can we do? I don't know, she said. I'm afraid. Me too, Klaus said. Huh? Sonny said as she stopped crying. Let's have some dinner, someone shouted from the dining room and the theatre troupe began pounding on the table in strict rhythm, which is an exceedingly rude thing to do. We'd better serve the Putinesca, Klaus said, or who knows what, what Count Olaf will do to us. Violet thought of what the bold man had said about wrecking her face and nodded. The two of them looked at the pot of bubbling sauce, which had seemed so cosy while they were making it and now looked like a vat of blood. Then, leaving Sunny behind in the kitchen, they walked into the dining room, Klaus carrying a bowl of the interestingly shaped noodles and Violet carrying the pot of Putinesca sauce with a large ladle with which to serve it. The theatre troupe was talking and cackling, drinking again and again from their wine cups and paying no attention to the Baudelaire orphans as they circled the table serving everyone dinner. Violet's right hand ached from holding the heavy ladle she thought of switching it to her left hand, but because she was right-handed, she was afraid she might spill the sauce with her left hand, which could enrage Count Olaf again. She stared miserably at Olaf's plate of food and found herself wishing she had bought poison at the market and put it in the Putinesca sauce. Finally, they were through serving and Klaus and Violet slipped back into the kitchen. They listened to the wild, rough laughter of Count Olaf and his theatre troupe and they picked up their own portions of food too miserable to eat. Before long, Olaf's friends were pounding on the table in strict rhythm again, and the orphans went out to the dining room to clear the table, and then again to serve the chocolate pudding. By now it was obvious that Count Olaf and his associates had drunk a great deal of wine, and they slouched at the table and spoke much less. Finally, they roused themselves and trooped back through the kitchen, scarcely glancing at the children on their way out to the house. Count Olaf looked around the room, which was filled with dirty dishes. Because you haven't cleaned up yet, he said to the orphans, I suppose you can be excused from attending tonight's performance. But after cleaning up, you are to go straight to your beds. Klaus had been glaring at the floor, trying to hide how upset he was. But at this, he could not remain silent. You mean our bed, he shouted. You've only provided us with one bed. Members of the theatre troupe stopped in their tracks at this outburst and glanced from, Clau from Klaus to Count Olaf to see what would happen next. Count Olaf raised his one eyebrow and his eyes shone bright, but he spoke calmly. 
If you would like another bed, he said, tomorrow you may go into town and purchase one. You know perfectly well we haven't any money, Klaus said. Of course you do, Count Olaf said, and his voice began to get a little louder. You are the inheritors of an enormous fortune. That money, Klaus said, remembering what Mr Poe said, is not to be used until Violet is of age. Count Olaf's face grew very red. For a moment, he said nothing. Then in one sudden move, movement, he reached down and struck Klaus across the face. Klaus fell to the floor, his face inches from the eye tattooed on Olaf's ankle. His glasses leaped from his face and skittered, skittered into a corner. His left cheek, where Olaf had struck him, felt as if it were on fire. The theatre troupe laughed and a few of them applauded as if Count Olaf had done something very brave instead of something despicable. Come on, friends, Count Olaf said to his comrades. We'll be late for our own performance. If I know you, Olaf, said the man with the hook hands, you'll figure out a way to get, that, get at that Baudelaire money. We'll see, Count Olaf said but his eyes were shining bright as if he already had an idea. There was another loud boom as the front door shut behind Count Olaf and his terrible friends and the Baudelaire children were alone in the kitchen. Violet knelt at Klaus's side, giving him a hug to try and make him feel better. Sonny crawled over to his glasses, picked them up and brought them to him. Klaus began to sob, not so much from the pain, but from the rage at the terrible situation they were in. Violet and Sunny cried with him and they continued weeping as they washed the dishes and as they blew out the candles in the dining room and as they changed out of their clothes and lay down to go to sleep. Klaus in the bed, Violet on the floor, Sunny on her little cushion of curtains. The moonlight shone through the window and if anyone had looked into the Baudelaire orphan's bedroom they would have seen the three children quiet, crying quietly all night long. So that was chapters three and four of A Series of Unfortunate Events, The Bad Beginning by Lemony Snicket. I'll see you next time. Bye.